Welcome back. Our next speaker is Nico Schutilius, who will share his experience in successfully running and marketing IPv6 only data centers. As some of you may actually recall, he already gave a talk at RIPE 79, but don't worry, Nico has new stories to tell. So welcome, Nico. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm very excited to talk about this. Um, mostly because IPv6 is really, really fun, be it technology-wise, be it business-wise. Um, before I jump into like uh, why uh, or how cool it is, just a little bit background of what I'm doing here. Um, I'm working at Ungleich and we are providing IPv6 only hosting. And this really means IPv6 only hosting. So there's no IPv4 involved. Um, besides, apart from that, um, every device in our data center is connected with IPv6. There's no, not a single device that is IPv4. Also because all internal networks are IPv6 only. Everything we do is open source. So today's speech is a little bit about um, inspiration. So if you like the idea of running IPv6 only stuff, or if you feel inspired, everything we do is open source and you can easily have a look at it. What's a bit special about our situation is we are here in the midst of the Swiss Alps and we have a lot of hydropower over here. So everything we do is 100% uh, running on renewable energy. And because we have a lot of old, really, really cool industrial area here, we don't use any kind of cooling. We're just using passive cooling. So just a little bit about what we do here and you see already how we do is a bit different maybe than let's say traditional data centers. Question is a little bit like when you start with, or when you think about IPv6 only hosting, you don't start and everything works right away. That would be great, but that's not the case. And today I would like you to guide a little bit through our experiences and yeah, what, what, uh, what mistakes we have done, uh, what we could have done better and what we are doing better now. And also about the, the lessons learned, which you might run into if you actually start doing IPv6 only services. So we actually started this whole thing in 2017. And 2017, we were building a prototype of a data center here in Glarus in Switzerland. And well, if you become a Lear in 2017 with the RIPE, well, then you get a slash 22. And for some of you, my 1024 IP4P addresses might sound a lot. It really isn't, especially not if you want to run thousands of VMs, it doesn't really, you know, fit together. So we had a, <laughs> I mentioned in another speech already, we had a very, very heated discussion here at Ungleich. We had basically, the three options were all on the table. Are we going to do IPv4 only in 2017? Are we going dual stack by default or are we going IPv6 only by default? And after very, very heated discussions and whether or not uh, the idea is good or not, we actually said, well, we'll give it a try and every virtual machine that we run will be IPv6 only. That doesn't mean it is unreachable from the IPv4 internet, but it actually means that the VM itself doesn't have an IPv4 address. So we are using, uh, at this stage, we call it stage one. Um, we actually call it the <laughs> nice and naive approach. It was really, really naive. Um, so the VMs are only on an IPv6 network, but they should be able to connect to the IPv4 internet. And they should also be reachable from the IPv4 internet. So in this phase, um, the VMs used DNS 6.4, which allows you to embed uh, IPv6 addresses for domains that don't have IPv6 addresses to connect outside to domains, which are IPv4 only. And we're using NAT64, which basically translates IPv6 packets to IPv4 packets and vice versa. Um, this way, IPv6-only VMs 
uh, can interact with the IPv4 internet and they are also reachable from the IPv4 internet. And it, it, this is a really, really nice setup because operationally, you're only dealing with IPv6 besides on the edge routers of your network where you actually do the translations or where you do the mappings. Well, very nice, um, you know, in theory. In practice, when you uh, start with this in 2017, we had a lot of services, um, for instance, some PHP frameworks, uh, which won't work without IPv4. So you have services that bind to 0000, which is the in address for IPv4. Um, some of those services can actually be tricked. So if you have a loopback interface, uh, you usually have the 127.0.0.1 assigned to it. And then binding to 0000 actually works. And you might or might not know that a lot of libraries nowadays, they have functions which let you bind to both IPv6 and IPv4 sockets at the same time. This is specifically true for Linux systems. And if you use those, everything is good. If you can't, if you have also some, uh, especially like in this, those times, Node.js frameworks had a problem and other frameworks, um, I can mention here cPanel, for instance. Uh, cPanel has hard-coded IPv4 addresses in their installation scripts. So when you try to run this in an IPv6-only network, it has to fail. Um, we talked to the developers of cPanel and uh, they are probably going to stop the product as is eventually. So there's not much development going on. Um, yeah, so that was 2017. And after roughly about half a year running the IPv6 only setup, we had to consider, well, this doesn't work if we want to be commercially interesting. So we, we can't, and we also didn't want to force the users into using something that is not feasible for them. So we kind of emerged from stage one. And, you know, we were still like looking at this, like, how, how do we have to proceed with this? Because we can't really focus on IPv4, like this, is, this cartoon illustrates. When you're, you're running IPv4 and everybody's going to IPv6, well, it's really not a future proven thing to do. So, but nonetheless, um, a lot of customers gave good feedback. They said, it's a great idea. It's a great thing to do. Some customers said like, uh, I don't understand this IPv6 thing. Why are the colons and not dots? So we changed our approach to uh, offer dual stack based VMs. Um, the only hardware that we had at the time in the data center that had IPv4 are the routers and obviously the VMs, but the VM hosts themselves were IPv6 only. So it was a bridged layer two network here. Well, good for customers, not so great if you want to like pursue your, uh, let's say your base uh, in, as a hoster, because what, what's your option? You basically have to buy a new IP4 space if you go down this road, which is really not a sustainable thing to do. Um, what we also had a look in, um, or problems in, in stage one is that some firmware uh, in the network cards actually doesn't support IPv6. And the background here is like all servers in our data center are stateless. So they boot from network, they're automatically configured by a configuration daemon, and then they are ready to serve for VMs. But the is it, server itself doesn't carry any state and the VMs are stored in a Ceph cluster, probably more or less, uh, I think, known terms here. Um, so we actually also had to uh, introduce an IPv4 only, or not IPv4 only, but an IPv4 based network to um, boot the servers. 
the, the problem was there, the beam sales in uh, 2017, 2018 now, where we are, sales went uh, on well, but there's always this strong tension between, you have a limited IPv4 address space, and on one hand, it's good for sales, on the other hand, it's really not good for sustainability. I mean, obviously you can buy IP addresses on the market, but that's, you know, uh, in my opinion, really not sustainable. And if I look at this, and I always use this comparison, like when you, um, when you look at cars nowadays, and you have the choice between a diesel car, you have the choice between a gasoline car, you have the choice between an electric car or a, um, I don't know the English term, but the hydro powered, uh, hydrogen powered cars. You have a lot of choices there, and you probably do best as a vendor nowadays if you still focus on gasoline and diesel cars, because that is what is being sold. That is something people trust on. But if you think about it, sustainability-wise, it is really not a sexy thing to do. It is really not something that you want to do, because you're not really contributing to the future. You're basically building something that is already obsolete. So again, we had some more discussions at Ungleich and we we're like, we, we can't, we don't want to continue this way. It is really not uh, something that fits with our philosophy. So we entered stage three. Uh, we launched a different website uh, that really says, well, we do IPv6 only hosting without incoming NAT64. So those VMs, are not reachable from the old IPv4 internet. And this is something really controversial in the beginnings, like why would you want to have an IPv6 only VM? Like for whom is it? Can you use this actually? And uh, it was very clear, like initially, um, we had a lot of requests from developers who said like, well, you know, I want to give it a try. I want to see if my application actually works. Um, and some applications didn't work and they were also quickly fixed, it's like uh, custom applications. And over the time, more and more people were like, okay, how, how can I make production use of this? And the current state uh, here in, uh, in at Ungleich is a lot, I would say something like around 80, 90% of the websites running here are IPv6 only. However, we do enable uh, on layer seven proxying with TLS, with, uh, without TLS for HTTP. So all things that run HTTP can actually be IPv6 only and can be bridged by a proxy service. Um, let me, you know, have a look a bit more into this. So in the first phase we said, well, we do one-to-one -one mappings. That was our first approach. But those one-to-one -one mappings are also not really helpful for saving IP addresses. So we want to have a one-to-end mapping. And those of you who are like in networking for quite some time, this reminds you of one thing and that is not. That's, and in principle, we're talking about the same thing we do in the IPv4 world where you're uh, using uh, private IP addresses with uh, CGNAT or any kind of other NAT. You, you want to maximize the number of hosts per public IPv4 address. And we introduced uh, HTTP and this is what I'm really proud of, also HTTPS proxying. So we have a proxy that allows incoming TLS-based connections without us opening them up. We also uh, bridge SMTP by SMTP forwarding. It's not the nicest setup, but it also works. And we're looking currently at uh, re or not reverse, but DNS delegations or DNS handling so that you can even run your DNS IPv6 only server, but also be reachable from the IPv4 world. Right, so, um, this is also a little bit of history so that you can see like what failures or what problems <laughs> you can cause. Our first approach actually to support IPv6 only web servers was by uh, using an Nginx web server, which would decrypt 
the or terminate the TLS uh, session with the uh, proper uh, certificate. And how we did this is it's quite nice because technically quite nice. Practically, I will tell you like what the problem is with it soon. So basically, the IPv4 to IPv6 proxy uh, in the upper page here would get a certificate from Let's Encrypt for the proper domain name that the IPv6 only server is actually serving. And because the A entry was pointing here to the proxy, it was actually able to get a valid certificate. The obvious problem here is we have to decrypt and re-encrypt. And we don't want to do this. We don't really want to um, see the traffic. We're not interested in it. And, and, and it also uh, adds a problem of like, well, the provider can look into the connection and we really don't want to. The nice thing is uh, TLS and HTTPS, which uses TLS, has something that's called server name indication. And that is during the first handshake when your browser actually says, I would like to have this website. It says, and this is the name. So we can actually, without even decrypting uh, the, the packet, we can just say, all right, this request is for this domain and it goes there. So it's very elegant. It requires no computation, which is nice, but much nicer. It doesn't allow us or it doesn't require us to decrypt and encrypt the con uh, connection. So from my point of view, it's a very, very nice approach. So coming to this, um, we have solved quite a lot of things there. Um, we're not using a lot of, uh, well, we're not using any IPv4 networks for, for the IPv6 only hosting. Then there is, you know, this is nice, but we wanted to go one step further. And uh, when you've seen my presentation on, on the RIPE conference a couple of years, I think, already ago, um, you remember that so far, not a lot of things changed. However, recently we entered what we call stage four, and that is we successfully got rid even of the IPv4 networks that we used for supporting servers to netboot. And we've, we found the problem that some network cards, uh, specifically Intel X520 cards, are those 10 gig fiber cards, their firmware doesn't necessarily support IPv6 netbooting. And there are other Mellanox Broadcom, Broadcom cards, which, you know, you can't really fix every firmware uh, to go IPv6 only netbooting. And there's a very, very easy trick to get around this problem. And that is you just use a very cheap, simple USB stick, which you can buy for something like five bucks, enter your currency here. Um, and you just put IPXE in it. And IPXE, for those of you who don't know it, is a tiny uh, PXE loader which actually supports IPv6 and IPX is also fully open source. So what you do is you load your operating system in quotes from the USB stick. The IPXE then switches to um, PXE on DHCP v6 basis and loads the real operating system. So this is a bit of chain loading, but it works very nice. And instead of spending hours or hundreds of francs or euros, on upgrading your hardware or trying to fix something that is not designed for what you want to do, you just plug in a USB stick and you're done. So it's very, very nice. What we also do is um, we're phasing back in the static NET64 mapping. Um, you remember this was like in our first stage, we, we did NET64 mappings. And for everything that's running a website, we, we recommend customers not to have a um, dedicated IPv4 address anymore, but there are services like uh, FTP, which is very hard to proxy. And believe me, <laughs> people are still using FTP, plain text, um, can't name customers there, but uh, it happens there. So what we do there is we do something that's called IPv4 as a service or IPv4 address uh, as a mapped service. And it's basically built, built on uh, NAT64 on the routers, which see 
if traffic is coming into this specific IPv4 address, we map it to this specific IPv6 address. Um, so this way, it's really, what is important here, people are really beginning to see IPv4 is actually an add-on and IPv6 is actually the default. And then, then we have this problem and we have solved it, I think, quite ele elegantly from the get-go. When people buy actually IPv6 only services, then you might be in the situation that your customer actually doesn't have IPv6, but buys IPv6 only services. And then you will you usually receive an email that says like, oh, I bought this, but I just found out I'm on a really old network that doesn't support IPv6. And I, what do I do now? And our answer is very easy. You just get an IPv6 VPN from us. And for VM customers, we include this for free. And for some people, we, we found out like not everybody is capable of handling a VPN. And for this reason, we actually developed a hardware box, which you can see at the bottom here, it's called the verb. And you just plug in the verb into your network, it establishes the IPv6 VPN, and it distributes IPv6 addresses to every computer in the network, just on the same cable as it uses IPv4 to establish the tunnel. So this way, we have really a um, way right now to connect people to IPv6 only resources without carrying too much. They just use it like the modern internet. So now, this, this talk is mostly about like how to maintain, you have heard a bit, how to market. And traditionally, we had this split or this uh, competition between connectivity providers, uh, internet providers, who say like, well, I don't offer IPv6 connectivity unless my customers want it. And then again, content providers or uh, hosting providers say like, well, I won't support IPv6 unless customers want it, but customers don't have IPv6 connectivity, so we cannot offer content on IPv6. The point is, everybody can have IPv6 connectivity today, and I mean it literally everybody. And if you see anybody who claims I can't have IPv6 connectivity, I go back just one slide and I say, you can have it with the verb. You don't have to use the verb. What I'm saying is there's nobody in the world who has, in my opinion, a good excuse to say, I don't have uh, IPv6 connectivity. Which brings you to a very interesting position. So anybody of you right now thinking about, well, can I actually offer IPv6 only resources or services? My answer is yes, definitely. And you might remember in the beginning I said, um, RIPE gave us the slash 22 and already this slash 22, the intention of RIPE to give it out is to enable people for transition to IPv6. You may recall that RIPE doesn't have a lot of IPv4 space left. Uh, actually, I think if you're lucky, you can get to a wait list right now. You might get a slash 24, but building any commercial service on top of this, this is like, you know, very tricky or hard to do. But as I said, you, you don't have to rely on IPv4 anymore. You can really, from my opinion, you can really go IPv6 only nowadays and it works again, you know, we're kind of the uh, proof of it. So that's it from my side. Um, I hope you can see a little bit of how it works. And I really want to say IPv6 is a lot of fun. It is not like nothing hard to do. It's nothing uh, impossible. And it's also nothing impossible to talk to your customers about. Uh, matter of fact, we have a lot of customers who don't even know what IPv6 is but they are still using it uh, with the verb of IPv6 only hosting with storage. All those services are running IPv6 only nowadays. And whenever a customer doesn't have IPv6, well, we just give uh, them a verb. If you want to have like further discussion, I added a little bit of context uh, here from the IPv6 chat uh, to IPv6 uh, email address or the blog. Um, I'm really curious to hear like what your opinions and questions are and um, I want to say, say thanks a lot for having me here today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be in a networking group here and to speak about IPv6 only services. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Nico. 
um, from what I gather from the chat, people are really, really enthusiastic uh, about what you are doing here. So I think you're on a good track here. Um, let's start with a bunch of questions. Um, the first one is by Simon. How did you have any trouble getting rather dumb devices such as PDUs, power meters, sensors, cameras, and so forth uh, to eat IPv6? <laughs> I think that is a very common problem. Well, yeah, yes and no. So uh, we do have uh, some of those devices. And what we do is actually we have some IPv4 islands where we have a fake IPv4 network, which is completely bridged to NAT64. So we actually use routers with two or three port routers, which are usually x86 simple uh, hardware. And we mimic an IPv4 only network, but we map each and every device to an IPv6 address. So while they're IPv4 only and they're an IPv4 only island, they are completely IPv6 reachable. They just don't know about it. That's the greatest part. Okay, so the next one is a little bit around how you actually manage everything on your data center. The two questions I think are tying into each other. If you're using common server operating systems, like we all know, how good is the support? Does the operating system upgrade servers and archives all support IPv6 or is there a different experience across different systems? So that one is very easy to answer. There's no issue whatsoever at all anymore. That's all the really more, yeah, no, th this, is, this used to be an issue and we're, we are having anything from uh, CentOS, DevOne, Debian, Alpine, no issues whatsoever anymore. It's like, ching, uh, ching, what? <laughs> okay, and following up that uh, from Stefan, did you write your own tools for data center management? Or yeah. was there anything off the shelf that you could use? Um, we are still using as a backend Open Nebula. We have developed uh, UnCloud as an add-on to this, um, which will actually use IPv6 addresses for um, builds so every build will have an ipv6 address just a side note um, our whole stack of tools is also online it's called ungleich-tools uh, you should probably find it on google um, yes so we, we did some custom development but a lot of like operating system and uh, let's say the standard stack that you have is actually quite capable of ipv6 so there are no issues Okay, so um, there was a little bit discussion about the encrypted SNI. So how does your HTTPS proxy work with encrypted SNI? I Sebastian and Mick were asking this. I, I love that this question is always coming. You I, look it, like you were expecting that. So I think you have something up there. It, it is so good. No, it, it's really good. And, and thanks for the question because it actually shows that people do the job here. And it's really cool. ESNI, the key is stored in DNS and what we need to do is we need to be able to decrypt the initial context. So we do actually need to have the key for decrypting the ESNI request. However, we don't need the key for, um, for the actual traffic. So we need to be able to decrypt which host it is. We know this, we have to know this, but we don't need to uh, inspect the content or decrypt the content. So this is a nice thing about ESNI because it has separation of concerns here. Thanks for the question, it's great, love it. Okay, very good. Um, let's get to some of the later questions. Oh yeah, that's a good, good one. Can you share any abuse insight? How much abuse are you actually handling and how are you handling that? Right. Is there anything specific in your case? No, <laughs> there's, um, we're currently having a policy not to accept things like Tor at the moment. Um, unfortunately, I, I would like to, but it's technically only probably let's say networking wise, it's a bit tricky to have such services. And I would say that 99% of the customers that we know of are in the white area. So, uh, and the 1% is in the gray area. Um, so we, we, we don't really have to deal with abuse much, to be honest. Okay. And let's go a little bit in the NAT64 topic. Uh, Somebody is asking, how is uh, doesn't NAT64 break DNSSEC? DNS64 does break uh, does break it. That is correct. Um, NAT64 doesn't. So just to distinguish, DNS64 is putting those fake entries in DNS, and that is correct. 
And my, my, my typical answer is like, if you don't, if you have a DNSSEC enabled domain and you don't want it to be broken, put a quadruple A record there. That, that's basically your, your job. If you don't, yes, we will break it. Okay, Very. makes a lot of sense. And let's go, uh, performance. Performance is always interesting in, in yeah. this kind of settings. How performant in terms of uh, PPS, bandwidth and so forth, it is proxying four to six stuff on your platform? Are there any relevant bottlenecks? Yes, no. <laughs> so uh, when we, uh, actually I will just skip some slides back. Um, to, to have here. The nice thing about the proxying approach is that we only inspect the first packet of the connection. And right now we're using HA proxy for this, but um, I gave a couple of speeches about doing NAT64 in hardware. And actually, uh, kind of a teaser, I will give another speech on Enoch on Friday about a hardware solution of NAT64. Doing this in hardware is really easy. And even doing this in software is really easy. And it doesn't use a lot of computation, but because, sorry for the longer answer here, but it, it's really cool because V4 packet and the V6 packet are not that different. I mean, they're a little bit shuffled, but basically you have source destination IP addresses in there and a little bit different headers. But basically it's a really, really low computation effort that you need to do to bridge from one to the other direction. So no bottlenecks introduced there and Again, small teaser with um, NAT64 in hardware using P4, you can in theory go to up to terabit uh, performance in hardware. It's really, really nice. Okay, I think we need to close the queue at this point because we are running out of time. One question that actually Florian threw in uh, our chat, you are calling everything un something. Is there gonna be a service called unsinn and what will it do? <laughs> Quick answer. <laughs> it's a really cool service. Um, it might be released on April Fool's Day. We'll see about it. Okay, we will see you there. So thank you so much, Nico. Uh, for everyone who still has questions, there will be a follow-up room where you can meet Nico and ask him questions. And otherwise, you have his contact information. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. I wish everybody a good uh, more Dinoc talks here. <laughs>